for the combination of the slow motion, the intensification before landfall, makes Ian worse. After being on our radar for more than a week, Hurricane Ian made landfall in the U.S. on Wednesday, September 28th as a strong Category 4 hurricane with sustained winds of 150 miles per hour and much higher gusts. After a forecast shift to the east just two days prior, Ian made landfall around Cayo Costa, Florida at 3.05 p.m. Altogether, after Ian affected Cuba, Florida, the southeast, and the mid-Atlantic, more than 150 fatalities were recorded, with 146 of them occurring in Florida. Most of them were caused by flooding, especially due to the storm surge. Ian is tied as the fourth strongest hurricane to hit Florida on record, tied with Major Hurricane Charlie from back in 2004 and the Major Florida Keys hurricane in 1919. In fact, Ian made landfall in almost the exact same location Charlie did just 18 years ago around Cayo Costa. As guidance was coming in, Ian was looking like it would make landfall in the Tampa Bay area, which would have been the first landfalling hurricane for this area in more than 100 years. After the forecast at Ian shifting east, Tampa Bay was taken out of the main impact area and all eyes turned to Fort Myers, Naples, Sanibel, and Pine Island. Coastal Fort Myers, shown here, was devastated by storm surge, heavy wave action, and sustained winds at 150 miles per hour at the peak of the event. Up to 15 feet of storm surge came in, but with Ian, higher depths were possible as it is hard to gauge the exact height of surge. Second story floors were reached, leaving homes and businesses submerged in the Gulf of Mexico waters. Buildings here in Fort Myers Beach were left unrecognizable and in many cases inaccessible after Ian moved away. Ian's devastating effects turned Southwest Florida upside down, tossing homes, boats, and vehicles around like toys. Ian was coming up off of Western Cuba and headed parallel to the state of Florida. So if you just kind of think of Florida, you know, the coastline runs relatively north-south on the west coast of the state mm -hmm. and on the east coast of the state. And the storm is generally moving south to north, right? And it's wobbling in that direction. So every wobble is going to count more than normal because that one wobble can move the track considerably to the south and the landfall spot to the south. So it was hard to communicate, harder to communicate with Ian that the uncertainty was bigger than normal for a case like Irma where the uncertainty was less. We knew it was going to hit the coast in Irma because it was kind of coming further south and had a bigger target essentially of land. So that was tricky. The second thing that was tricky was Irma, I mean, Ian was rapidly intensifying toward the coastline. So Irma was not. Irma was already very mature, already very powerful and actually weakening on its approach to Florida. Ian was doing the opposite. It was strengthening quickly on its approach to Florida. So that was very different. And then the, the other part that was, was bad as well is Ian was moving slow. So it was going to be a bigger rainfall producer and it was going to be a bigger storm surge producer because slow motion matters greatly for those two hazards. So for the combination of the slow motion, the intensification before landfall makes Ian worse than those predecessors that I mentioned. Damage amounts are near 74 billion after Ian, and the southwest side of Florida was not the only area impacted. Ian brought damaging floods all across central Florida, cut power to more than 11 million customers, and spun up several confirmed tornadoes, leading to additional damages across southeast Florida. At one point, all of the neighborhoods across Orlando were flooded, as 14 inches of rain piled up within 24 hours, leading to 250 water rescues. Eventually, Ian made its way north and northwest, leading to the second U.S. landfall in South Carolina on Friday, September 30th, before weakening further over North Carolina and Virginia. As conditions got better and better across Southwest Florida, first responders and utility companies got to work. Many who could not escape the storm surge or who were left stranded needed to be airlifted, especially out of Sanibel and Captiva Islands, where the causeway was severed in multiple places. Governor DeSantis had declared a state of emergency four days prior to Ian's landfall on September 24th for the entirety of Florida. This unlocked emergency resources to be used to help Floridians before and after Ian's impact. Crews immediately began digging through the damage, to not only search for those who may not have made it out, but also to clean and open paths for emergency officials and aid to get through. 
Due to the Sanibel Causeway sustaining so much damage, many were left stranded on Sanibel and Captiva Islands. But construction quickly began to provide a temporary fix to get resources, including power, to residents and business owners. The causeway opened just 21 days later in mid-October. Ian is one for the history books, and there's much work to be done, even for years to come.